Good afternoon, everybody. Um, this talk is about the multi-layer linear elastic theory. It's not a very long uh, presentation, but it's slightly complicated. And uh, in order to save you the problem of really making notes, every slide has got the information you need. So you can listen and, and keep the slides themselves, and you shouldn't need anything else. All right, um, slide number one. Oops, where do we go? Uh, uh. <clears throat> First of all, you need to know about the assumptions behind linear elastic theory. They're not all true, or only partly so. In particular, all the layers have to comprise a uniform linearly elastic material. And by linearly, we mean that the stress is equal to a constant times the strain. Um, e in this particular equation is a constant. But many materials are not very linear. In other words, E is not a constant. And that gives us a, a minor problem. The other assumption that is not true at all is that the layers must be homogeneous, or it's, they're assumed to be homogeneous. By that, I mean they're uniform, there are no discontinuities, no cracks, no big voids, and the layers are infinite in horizontal extent. Also not true. And therefore, there is a lack of agreement between calculated properties and the properties measured in real roads. So it is perhaps surprising that the method is used so frequently and with apparent success. So let us answer the, answer the question why this should be so. The point is that the errors or the differences between the, the theoretical calculations and the and measured values uh, are usually systematic rather than random. In other words, if something looks as if it's twice as strong as something else, then a similar design it would also be twice as strong as the as the theory predicts. So basically, <clears throat> if the errors are systematic, we can deal with it. <clears throat> but the method has to be calibrated by comparison with measured performance values before sensible conclusions can be obtained. So the key to using the MLET is to calibrate one of the models properly. And of course, the calibration must be correct. And this means that the performance of the payments used for calibration must be thoroughly understood. We must know why, what, why they are deteriorating or failing, what the critical stresses and strains within the pavement are. In other words, a doctor cannot cure you unless he finds out what is wrong. So we have to find out exactly why the pavements are behaving as they are before we can calibrate the model. But fortunately, most pavements will not differ very much from those that should have been used to calibrate the MLET. For example, roads with granular unbound bases and structural asphalt surfacings will normally consist of an unbound sub-base and a road base of materials that meet standard specifications and of thicknesses ranging from about 250 up to about 500 millimetres. The thickness of the asphalt surfacing will also be a fairly narrow band, typically between 100 and 200 millimetres. Thus, provided the MLET has been calibrated for the specific type of structure being considered, it can predict the relative performance of similar pavements with reasonable accuracy. And that's really basically what we, what we use it for. <coughs> This is an example. Um, this pavement has successfully carried 1.1 million equivalent standard axles of traffic over a 12 to 15 year period. You can see the example shows a crushed stone road base, a granular sub base, a capping layer, and the subgrade is category S3, which is a CBR of between 5 and 7%. And there are the thicknesses of the layers in the particular road. <coughs> The first step is to calculate the stresses and strains at critical points in the structure. 
These are the critical points created by an equivalent standard axle load, a standard, a standard axle load that is used in all the calculations. This is actually the dual wheel assembly at the end of, a, of, an, of an axle with two wheels. In this example, the critical stress and strain is the maximum vertical stress or strain on the subgrade. In other words, in this particular example, we believe that the subgrade failed because the stresses were too, too large or the strains were too large on the subgrade. Critical stresses and strains elsewhere in pavements can and do occur, causing different failure modes. But the principles of analysis are broadly the same. So as long as you know how it's failing, how it's performing, we can use the multilayer elastic theory. <clears throat> the use of the multilayer elastic program needs data, obviously, for each calculation. And the data is fairly stand standard, straightforward. We need to know the elastic modulus of all the layers. We need to know their Poisson's ratio. We know, really we need to know the load that is going to go on the layers. In other words, as I said, the standard axle. <clears throat> it is necessary to identify from design manuals the thicknesses of the layers in the pavements that we think will carry the traffic loadings required. So we have this example road that is, is failing. And we want to design using multilayer elastic theory uh, similar roads for different traffic levels. So in this particular case, I've said traffic levels T4, T5, and T6. So we're going to design three more roads based on the results of the multilayer elastic model. Obviously, as I've said, we need the elastic properties of the layers. So these are typical examples. Uh, I won't read them out, but basically the surface is a surface dressing and we don't uh, need to know its thickness. The road base has an elastic modulus of 350, sub base 161, etc. These will be measured in the laboratory uh, by creating samples that are the right density of moisture content and uh, testing them in the laboratory equipment. So that's where the elastic modulus or moduli come from. <clears throat> uh, just to remind you what the standard axle is, the load conditions we usually use are the dual wheel at the end of a standard axle. This comprises two circular loads of 20 kilonewtons, so it's a, an 80 kilonewton axle completely, uh, applied with a pressure, uh, a pressure of 577 kilopascals. And uh, basically, that's what the footprint of the of the two wheels at the end of, of the axle looked like. The rate with the <coughs> the standard axle load that we're talking about, the radius of contact area for each wheel is 105 millimeters. And by coincidence, the distance between the wheels for this particular axle is also 105 millimeters. So these are just input data to the multilayer elastic theory. <clears throat> now, this particular standard load, there is a little bit of controversy because obviously all the vehicles do not have the same loading. So you have to convert their load to how many standard axles it is. And these days, that's a little bit more difficult than it used to be because, um, for example, drivers who overload their trucks often increase their tire pressures so the standard axle will understate the pavement damage. And there are also some new uh, designs of, of, of lorries where the, the axle, the main load bearing axle is not a dual tandem at all, but it has single wheels, which are actually uh, uh, much more damaging than the dual wheels that we're normally used to. So we have to deal with that. We can convert all these other loads into standard axles if we know enough about them. Uh, <clears throat> so both problems are dealt with during pavement performance analysis by increasing the standard axles values for particular vehicles of these unusual types. So that is a problem, but we do need to know the actual loads. We need to have measured the actual loads uh, at regular intervals throughout the lives of the road to see what's happening. Uh, <clears throat> 
Now, going on to the actual calculations, there are several basic MLET programs that are freely available. Uh, there used to be rather more, but there's uh, for some reason the number has reduced. KenPave is a good example. Uh, these programs, they require the X, Y, Z coordinates of the locations where the stresses and strains are to be calculated. And then it provides a tabulation of stresses, strains and displacements in all three directions or dimensions. Hence, it produces a quite a large amount of data. <clears throat> in this example, the maximum vertical stress and strain at the top surface of the subgrade are required because that's the mode of failure that we are assuming in this particular case. <clears throat> now, to actually do the calibration uh, of the MLET, there are essentially two methods. Method one, we develop a new subgrade strain criteria. So to do so, the, kit, the critical strain that caused failure must be measured. We know from very many research studies throughout the world that the relationship between the subgrade strain and the number of repetitions of that strain follows the general equation shown here in the slide. In this particular case, we know that the road has carried 1.1 million equivalent standard axles and we've measured the subgrade strain at 855 microstrain and therefore we can calculate the value of the constant A, which in this case came to 5,470. Uh, 5, so we've basically calibrated the subgrade strain with the data from the road that we're studying. Method two, uh, if we haven't measured the critical subgrade strain or the critical stress or strain in our road, the more usual method is to select a subgrade strain criterion developed by a reliable research organization. The subgrade criteria usually also conforms to the same equation that I've just mentioned before. <coughs> but the value, <coughs> excuse me, the value of A depends on the properties of the subgrade and is usually related to the CBR or the classification of the subgrade material. <coughs> So, so far, very similar to the previous method. The value of A and the exponent 7.5 developed for many different subgrades by the research of Lynn Irwin and Vincent Janu and team in, in America in 1997 to 2002 using the US Army's accelerated testing facility in New York State is the recommended um, failure criteria to use. They looked at over a dozen different pavements, uh, different moisture contents, and measured quite accurately the <coughs> strains that created the failure conditions. Now, the, the reason I mention this now is because in the, old, in the past, the strain criteria developed during the Ashto road test in America in 1960-61 has been used for many years and this is a very conservative criteria. Uh, we've found now in recent years that the performance of subgrades is rather better than uh, that particular uh, equation would predict. And the reason is not difficult to understand. The road test took place in a part of America where the subgrade soil froze during the winter and during the spring, when it thawed, it became extremely weak. So it was very difficult for the researchers to actually determine what that subgrade would have, how it, how it would performed if there wasn't this winter freeze and spring thaw. And as I say, the, the results were a relatively conservative criteria. And the ones that we're now recommending are less conservative and I think really quite accurate. We've been using them for a number of years now. Um, right, so uh, what we are now trying to do is to predict the designs for rows on subgrade T4, uh, 4, 5 and 6. On the left hand side here you can see the original design that only carried 1.1 million standard axles. 
and using the data that we've now collected we can try different payments uh, we would use the normal design charts to choose which payments to try and as you can see in this particular case uh, on structure one the design charts would suggest that, that those are the designs but when you put those into the MLAT model it predicts that the traffic will only be 3.8 million standard axles in other words about half what uh, we might have expected from the design charts now that's as I said right at the beginning the MLAT is, is calculating relative performance so it's not surprising that the traffic capacity is half what we might have expected because the test road the one on the left hand side also only carried about half what we'd have expected and so on so the calibration follows through for all the new roads and as you can see uh, from the middle line and the second from bottom line the actual calibrated capacity is a, about half what we'd have expected from the existing design charts now um, oh sorry uh, In this particular worked example, I have assumed that the payment we are using for calibration failed because the structure was not sufficient to protect the subgrade any longer. Hence, it was necessary to design the new payment to reduce the vertical stress and strain on the subgrade to lower values by means of the calibration. Now, as I said, the difference between this calibration and the design charts is a factor of two. You may be surprised by that. <clears throat> the problem is that there is a huge variability between the performance of pavements that are normally of the same design. In the Ashto road test, for example, typically the poorest performing pavement of a particular strength would carry between 10 and 15 percent what, what the most successful one would so that variability is perfectly normal uh, shouldn't be surprised by it um, <clears throat> so there's this warning that I'm putting up now <clears throat> we've used the critical subgrade strain in this particular case <clears throat> Uh, because we're fairly certain that the mode of failure of this particular pavement was known and was correct. But very few other stresses or strains have been measured to the same extent in research studies. Hence, any other calibration for another mode of failure, for example, failure in the, in the sub-base or failure near the surface, for example, it's going to be very much more diff difficult to calibrate because there simply is not enough data about the actual critical stresses and strains. The subgrade failure is the most common and uh, most reasonable assumption to make when we've only got limited data and that's really what we've done in this example. Yes, I think you're now active. So. Yes. Since he's having problems hearing questions, so if you could repeat the question, relate the question, that's in time. Uh, so we are now going to take questions and uh, and then uh, you'll respond after maybe each question. And um, now for those uh, providing questions, uh, we'll face the same challenge we faced in the morning. So it's good to come up here and then talk and then, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Any questions, comments, suggestions, please? Okay, John, there's a question coming up or a comment or something, so pay attention. So, th th thank you. Thank you, Mr. John, for your excellent presentation. So, 
yeah, I was uh, here. I was uh, uh, listening to your presentation very carefully. It was uh, very informative. So uh, my question just uh, uh, say yes, uh, as you say that the layer is not perfectly elastic. Uh, so and some other limitations. So you are uh, you are suggesting for calibrating the result. Uh, but uh, the process of calibration uh, is a little bit uh, I was not. Uh, uh, um, I could not understand the how uh, it, 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 it would be calibrated. So if you just, uh, I, I don't know any other uh, listener they have uh, answered. So if you just uh, uh, again, just uh, the very um, discuss, <coughs> it will be very grateful to you. Thank you. <coughs> that is a difficult question because uh, the, I, I'm not sure whether I can go through that all again. Um, the key point is that uh, the multilayer elastic theory allows you to to calculate the relative values for a different structure. The values might not be what you might get if you measured them, so you have to scale them by getting some real data from a real road to do the calibration. So that is really the last three or four slides. I mean, I, I don't know which part you didn't quite follow. I know the first time you see these things, they they come at you like a bolt from the blue. Uh, but uh, it's actually very well explained in Appendix A of the draft manual. I don't know whether you've got a copy of uh, Appendix A. Um, in fact, I've just read Appendix A. It's better than my lecture. <laughs> um, I, as I say, I don't really know where to start except at the beginning of the lecture again. Um, maybe you could be a bit more precise about which particular part you didn't understand. I mean, it was all done in 20 minutes, so it's a quite a quick thing to take a lot in all at once. I can understand why it might be a little bit tricky first time Hello, around. John. John, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, uh, can you just explain the two methods of calibration? Maybe that would help using either the measured or a standard structure known to have performed. Well, can you can you put the slides up? I can't do it in the dark. I couldn't see the presentation. It didn't okay. come on my screen. Okay, I will try to do that right there. Yeah. Yeah. The, oh. Can I control this or not? No, you cannot control it. I am controlling it. So tell me which slide would be most well, useful to uh, you. Yeah, go back, go back two, go back one. Forward or, or back? Back, back. Go to what I've called method one. Okay. Method one is the is the best method because it's the way you're actually calibrating against a known uh, pavement whose performance you've measured. And the critical point is that you've measured the amount of traffic it will carry and you have measured the critical stress or strain. And the point is that uh, that equation that you can see there, the number of applications of that strain uh, will follow that equation. That's a fairly well established equation. Um, all, all studies have given a very similar equation. They may have got a slightly different uh, exponent. <clears throat> and of course, the value of A is what you need. 
So if you've got one example of a road that has carried n million standard axles and you've measured the, the stress or the strain mu e, um, you can use that equation to calculate the value of a, which then means that you can calculate the stress uh, that can be tolerated for any number n. You can put any number n in, in there, use the equation and it will tell you what the uh, effect, the stra stress or strain can be tolerated by that particular pavement design. So essentially, um, <clears throat> that is your calibration. You <clears throat> put in your your uh, you have to get your your designs from the design chart to see which one you want to try. You put the values of the elastic properties into the multi-layer elastic theory. Um, can you go back a slide, Andrew? No, back one more. Oh, I want to see the one that shows you the parameters of the elastic theory. Uh, it says the first thing you need is the elastic modulus of all the layers. <coughs> you need the Poisson's ratio for all the layers. You need the <coughs> load characteristics of the standard axle that you're going to use which is quite well known and you need um what else do you need um obviously the, <coughs> the thicknesses of the layers that you're going to try and you just put them into the multi-layer elastic model and it will give you the stress or the strain at the critical points that you you, you ask for so using the model itself is probably the easy part is getting the actual values that work for your particular design and as I say method one you've got a real payment that you can measure it's just failing you can measure the critical strain at the subgrade level and that uh, then goes into the uh, your your calculations you then try other designs that you want to use put them thicknesses and so on into the elastic modules mod, model, model see uh, find the values that give you the strain that you want to carry and the job's done but uh, that's not possible for everybody because you don't have a pavement that you can use to do the calibration so method two is simpler you simply use <coughs> the equations uh, developed by research organizations or the one you like best most research organizations well not most but many have uh, calculated the the critical stresses for different values of uh, of n and they have got that that equation that you can see there so instead of developing your own you can choose somebody else's um, the one that we recommend, I think, in the manual, there are two two particular ones. There's a, the Australian method, uh, basically because the Australian criteria for critical stresses uh, agrees with what we've measured in our studies and also agrees with the values uh, <coughs> that they calculated from this study that I mentioned here by Lynn Irwin and Vincent Janu in 1997 to 2002 at the US Army's Accelerated Testing Facility. Um, their results are uh, much less conservative than the old results from the Ashto Road Test. And as I pointed out, I think the Ashto Road Test in 1960 is the criteria that's been used for many, many years but the problem with that is that the Ashto road test was on a soil that froze in the winter and became very strong, but in the spring it thawed and became very, very wet. So the, the performance of that road varied dramatically with season and it was quite difficult to actually calculate these parameters that we're talking about here. Uh, and the one that was used <coughs> as developed from the Ashto road test is very conservative. It's actually given rise to probably a lot of over design um, and that is something that we've 
we've been finding recently in our studies that quite often the subgrades are uh, quite a lot stronger and will carry more traffic than in the old Ashto method. So these, I think these are quite dramatic improvements and I think they're going to save us all a lot of money. Sorry, but I, I, maybe I haven't answered your question, but uh, Appendix A is a very good, <clears throat> a good summary of it all as well. So uh, <clears throat> if you've got access to that, have a look at that. Okay. So, Chairman, should we take any more questions or we move to the next? I think we can move to the next if someone has an emergency question, we can allow it. Okay, and uh, John, uh, thank you very much. We are moving to the next presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I Okay, the next uh, presentation is very short, uh, so we shall finish on time and then I'll show you something quick. That should be uh, it. Um, basically, um, this slide follows on from this set of presentation of slides follows on after you're finished um, getting your pavement structures or designing your pavement structures. It doesn't all stop there. In fact, what we're going to see is that you may end up actually throwing away everything that you've designed because of these. Uh, I've called it rationalization of designs. Um, so that uh, it's sort of bringing your designs back to, to, to reality. So after selecting structure options, uh, a final option is required because at some point you have to present one, you present all of your options and then recommend one because you cannot leave that decision to whoever hired you to, 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 to do a design. Now, you may have to uh, do some enhancements to your design or actually downgrade your design at, for the final option. And this uh, pins very heavily on the economic analysis and ancillary considerations. And these two key aspects can actually cause a full redesign to, to have to be uh, undertaken. Now, uh, you have to still, uh, even after defining your uniform sections, you still have to identify critical sections of the road where some extra uh, aspects have to be done. For example, where overtopping of an embankment is likely to occur in each section so that you take some uh, remedial actions or remedial design. Uh, where capillary rise is likely to occur, where track speeds are likely to be slow and cause more stressing on, on your asphalt layers. And you have to apply uh, some solutions. And in the case of Road Note 31, you'd have to go to chapter six and seven 
uh, to maybe enhance the climate resilience of, of these sections through embankment protection, barriers for capillary rise, addressing subsurface drainage, or you may actually have to change uh, the final uh, road level to avoid some of these things. You also have to do technology considerations. And uh, the key question you ask is, can materials uh, be achieved to the specified quality? Uh, uh, Dr. Mamoun was uh, talking about the recycled asphalt. Um, if you specify it or if you use it in your design, you have to ask yourself this question, that when it comes to the actual construction, will you achieve those qualities? based on your knowledge of the construction quality and practice in the area. Uh, you may require uh, a specification change, or you may require compensation by increasing the specified uh, quality or thickness or content of something. You may also be required, and these days it's becoming really crucial where it comes to um, uh, foreign funded projects either by aid or loan or, or grant you may be required to show that you have done some carbon footprint considerations, which we have covered in chapter 13 and my colleague covered in the morning. And this can cause a major shift. For example, you may be forced to change all materials that were based on hot mixing to emulsion based materials or other materials. Uh, or change concrete back to asphalt because you saw the, the carbon footprint considerations. Uh, uh, technology considerations as well. Uh, contractors often prefer certain layer thicknesses due to the ease of construction. Uh, for example, in the morning, uh, you have seen that our design led us to 175 mil of uh, a base layer and 200 mil of the cement bound layer. But contractors tend to like, uh, at least the ones I know, they tend to like the 150s, uh, 150 layers, they find it easier to work with. So you may have to adjust uh, your layer thicknesses to, to take into account this. Um, you may also uh, have to undertake uh, the redesign considerations. For example, if you undertook significant subgrade replacement, um, you could actually reduce uh, pavement layer thicknesses. So you may have to really rethink uh, the subgrade replacement that you've used. There's also the issue of problem soils. Uh, these are expansive soils or collapsible or erodible soils. What actions are you going to take to protect them? Advice is given in chapter three. Uh, the, the use of uh, recycled materials and lower pavement layers. This is a very good sale for uh, grant funded projects. So they like to see this. And uh, the use of geosynthetics is also quite uh, good. Uh, they are usually a propriety in nature, so you want to liaise very, very closely with the supplier or manufacturer to, to optimize your design. Um, rock fail to enhance drainage uh, where rock is available. And uh, in terms of uh, specifying materials, we have some of these uh, material specifications in the road north, but this may not be compatible with your standard specifications for roads and bridge works that you may have in your country. And that means uh, something has got to give. Either the designer would have to request uh, for special permission to use these specifications, or the designer has to switch to the country specifications and adjust thickness designs accordingly, either higher or lower. So there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, specifying bituminous mixes, for example, what, which of the bituminous mixes would you go for uh, in, in your uh, pavement design? Now, you have to cross-check 
everything that you do with national or agency specifications to make sure you comply uh, or otherwise ask for some special permissions. Uh, improving the performance of asphalt, uh, rack resistance, areas of slow moving trucks like uh, climbing lanes, and to mitigate against the increased stresses of super single tires. I, I don't know uh, whether super single tires are in wide use now in Bangladesh, but they, they're definitely coming if they haven't yet already come. Uh, so there are these methods I talked about in the morning, um, which are cheaper uh, than others, and, and then ultimately the super paid uh, method which you can use. Um, also durability, uh, cracking is a major issue. Major issue. Uh, how to avoid as well uh, water ingress is also another issue, and any any other. Uh, things that could affect the performance of your design. Now, in particular, we have included uh, in the guide some uh, guidance on uh, preventing or mitigating against premature failures of the asphalt, uh, mostly targeted at addressing uh, issues that would come as a result of climate resilience or extreme loading uh, of these and my colleague uh, discussed this in the morning. Um, I've already talked about uh, the use of geogrids, drainage layers, making sure you have good shoulders, because if you don't, the water ingresses from the shoulder and affects uh, the actual pavement or, or the carriageway. And it is very good practice to document every stage of your design because things can get very complicated and messy later on, especially if failures occur and you may be uh, held to account. Um, the ultimate thing is usually budget and economic considerations. Now, the cost estimate of the final technical choice would be higher than the budget and which means you have to either recommend stage construction or use a shorter design life or change your technical choice uh, to be able to meet budget requirements. Also, uh, the cost estimate uh, of the final choice could be lower than the budget, but this is very rare to, to have uh, more budget available than what you need. Uh, but if that happens, you should take advantage and go for higher specs and, and more protection for your pavement. Uh, of course, you can carry out uh, HDM4 analysis or similar uh, economic analysis as well. Uh, during the break, uh, somebody spoke to me and asked uh, if I was the person who was referred to somewhere uh, regarding HDM4 training, and I said, yes, uh, we do this uh, at TRL, we offer that uh, training, and big part, uh, the more the people, the better the package for different uh, uh, users. Now, so in conclusion, uh, pavement designs will often change from the initial catalog selections due to rationalization measures. And at, that, uh, at this point, actually, also want to emphasize that it's now very good practice to check your designs uh, using mechanistic analysis, mechanistic empirical, uh, where you will have the time. Uh, you should always undertake upgrade and protective measures so that uh, you avoid uh, uh, premature failures. And in some cases, downgrades will often be necessary. Um, I, I sort of remember a, a design uh, from Sri Lanka that was almost completely downgraded. Um, the engineer should always document key decisions and seek deviation from standards um, from the authority concerned or the agency concerned before uh, specifying anything. Uh, the national or agency specifications will often override 
uh, any other specifications. So it's always good to comply unless you are very sure, in which case you then seek the deviation from standards. And that is all for, for that. Uh, I just want to quickly show you that uh, we have uh, on the website of the road note a spreadsheet that is made to make some of the processes easier. Um, you can actually, after some time, uh, do all your pavement thickness selection using the spreadsheet once you've gone through the document and it becomes clearer what we're trying to do. But um, I want to emphasize, uh, especially for tomorrow's case, um, where my colleague will be dealing with rigid pavements, that the method that will be used will require a traffic load distribution. So you'll be required to enter some of uh, the a, a sample of data collected from an axle load survey in order to use that method. And once this is entered in this spreadsheet, whatever it discusses tomorrow becomes very easy because the spreadsheet will generate the traffic load distribution to be used in that method. It's very simple, straightforward. You select uh, the vehicle class and the uh, load on each of the axles, and then it will uh, generate a, a distribution. Um, other than that, um, the example that we did in the morning, uh, if you remember, can also be done through this spreadsheet and you still end up with the same uh, choices of, of the structures that, that we got in the morning. Um, so you can actually use this to change also uh, the foundation class that you're designing for you can go to that and then that automatically generates the structures that you need uh, and the capping required and so on. So it's useful to, 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 to have, especially for tomorrow's session, if you are uh, doing uh, rigid pavement design because it will require some load distribution, which is not easy to do by hand. Um, now, the spreadsheet has not been locked. It's fully open. Uh, but the critical places where they are formulae are highlighted in yellow cells or red cells. It's open because the preference of spreadsheets vary from person to person. The way you set up your spreadsheet may not be the way I like to set up mine. The way I set up mine may not be the same you like to. So we've left it open so that you can reprogram it to your uh, own preference. Um, and that's available together with the, the road note documents. Some guidance is provided in the first uh, sheet here of the spreadsheet. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, it's uh, I think about uh, uh, 25 minutes past three. And uh, I think that will be it from us for today. Yeah, and I don't know if we we'll do some questions or. Okay. We've been given a chance for one or two questions or comments. So no question, then I can give my concluding remarks and then close this point. Okay, just a minute so my colleague is consulting. Yeah, yeah. So maybe you can tell that the feedback now if they can put the minutes for the screen. Okay. Okay, I've been informed that uh, uh, there are some feedback forms where you have the chance to uh, rate us how we have performed for today. 
and any recommendations. Uh, it takes about five minutes to fill them in, so please fill them in. It's about today's session. Then tomorrow we will have the session on rigid pavements, concrete pavements. And we shall also have a, a presentation by our colleagues from University of Southampton to show you their decision support tool in prioritizing interventions for um, uh, climate resilience on, on any road network. So please uh, fill this from Z. And uh, I presume there will be a refreshment break after. Same place. OK, I've been informed that there are refreshments just outside here. So after the chairman closes uh, with his remarks, you can do that. Uh, uh, back to you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you.